um, I would be very uh, happy to uh, answer any questions anybody has on the subject. Um, and if you do have some um, uh, questions, I will do my best to answer. Um, but while I know a lot about Buddhism, I don't know everything. I certainly know a lot. So if I'm not familiar with, um, I'm not capable of answering your question, I will, I will simply say so. But uh, I'll be very surprised if somebody can ask me a question which I don't have an answer for. So I, I leave it open to anybody. So if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Okay, question number two. Oh, well, why not question number one? You have already answered question number one. Oh, I see. Good. In general, we know one... In general, we know one takes time to learn local language. How does the Buddha know the local languages when he first arrived in a place where they speak different languages than their own language? Okay, well, that's, that's a quite an intelligent question. Thank you for that. Well, as I said, um, please keep in mind that these languages were probably related and in some cases quite similar to each other. And of course, the Buddha may very well have already uh, uh, become familiar with a language in a certain uh, region before he actually went there, because people from that region may have already come to see the Buddha, or they may have been merchants traveling who met the Buddha and he uh, met them. Uh, so so uh, I think the questioner is asking, if you don't know Chinese and you go to China, you're not going to pick up Chinese very, very quickly. That certainly is the case. But if you were from northern China and you spoke Putonhua or uh, what do you call it, uh, Mandarin, and then you went to um, where they speak uh, Te Chu or something like that, probably you could pick it up fairly quickly because those languages are related. And that would have been the situation for the Buddha in northern India at that time. Okay, what's the uh, number three? The Buddha said that while he was teaching for 45 years, he had not uttered a single word. What does he mean by that? Goodness me, words are not important. We should learn the Dhamma experientially rather than intellectually. Well, the Buddha never actually said that. Um, that is a... Um, I think it's a quotation from one of the Pragna Paramita Sutras, which date from at least five or six hundred years um, after the Buddha. And I think the, uh, what, uh, what the uh, claim is trying to communicate is the idea that he, what, what you've said at the end of your question, that is that book learning or sound learning, if you like, uh, is not adequate. You need the experience as well. But if you take that first statement seriously, of course, it's quite ridiculous. <laughs> how, could, how, how could the Buddha communicate by saying nothing, you know? Uh, perhaps I could do that during my next talk. I could just sit for 45 minutes and say nothing. What could I communicate? So that uh, statement is not in the uh, Tipitika, and it comes from at least five or 600 years after the Buddha. Um, good evening, Venerable. Well, good evening. Uh, some scholars postulate that Pali may be the Magadha languages. What will be your opinion? Well, that's unlikely. Um, we know the region the Buddha came from, which is roughly on the on the northern border, the northern edge of the Ganges Plain, which is now roughly partly the flatlands of southern um, Nepal and uh, uh, close by region in India. Okay, so, and we also know that um, it is not correct to say that. Um, the Sakyan lands was an independent kingdom. Um, it was actually under the control, the indirect control of the kingdom of Kosala. Uh, and it was closer to Kosala than it was to Magadha. So uh, it's very likely that uh, the language that the Buddha spoke in his homeland was a dialect of the Kosalan language. And once again, unfortunately, we don't know what that language was. Um, but uh, so the general feeling is that it was probably a dialect of Kosalan, not Magadan. Uh, 
Um, anything else? Yeah, one more question just came in. Good. Bante, it is very interesting. Uh, advantage. It is very advantage to mention about the verbal communication and chanting of suttas that they self correct when chant as a group. Is this the reason why most of the suttas which were recited today can be considered fairly intact? Um, okay, I get the meaning of your question. So your question is, is, um, is the, um, the Pali, uh, are the Pali suttas uh, a very accurate description of the meaning of what the Buddha said because the Sangha chanted them in a, a communal chanting? Is that the reason? Well, I would say that that's one of the reasons. But of course, the, uh, another reason would be that they considered them to be sacrosanct. They considered them to be extremely important. So great care was taken um, not to uh, or, or to remember them accurately. And in fact, this is an interesting point which I should uh, bring out. It's probably only inaccuracies slipped into the Tipitaka when they were written down. Because if a person is writing the Tipitaka, you only need one person to write and he can make mistakes. He can, incidentally, he can change bits too. But if you're doing it in a congregation, 50 people, 60 people, you, there's no way that you can, um, if you try to introduce something else or if you get uh, you you forget a part or you mispronounce a part, the mere weight of all of the others doing it accurately or doing it completely will will automatically correct you. So um, that's partly the reason, but because the other reason was that they generally had very well developed memories, and the other reason is is because when people consider something to be sacred, and certainly they considered the the wisdom. Within uh, embodied within the Buddha's words to be very, very sacred. So they took great care. They really cared about this. And in fact, this is one thing that we can honor, particularly Sri Lanka, the, the Sri Lankan tradition, for, is that through thick and thin, through hard times and difficulties and sometimes great challenges, they um, uh, took great care to preserve the Tipitaka for us. And that's a, that's a wonderful gift that they have um, given to us. Okay, a sixth question. Uh, good evening, Bhante. King Asoka's son, Venerable Mahinda, brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Do you think uh, Bhante Mahinda preached the Buddha's teachings in Magadhi or in Sinhalese? Well, we don't know. Uh, certainly, he wouldn't have uh, known Sinhalese. But of course, uh, the stories about uh, Mahinda, maybe they're not exactly what happened. You know, he arrived on the shores and he got to Anuradhapura and he met the king and he said, hello, I'm going to give you a sermon in, in uh, Sinhalese. Probably he was there for quite some time before he started uh, preaching. In fact, it is very likely that Mahinda arrived as a part of a cultural delegation, what you'd call nowadays a cultural delegation. When one country uh, recognizes, formally recognizes another country, then one country will uh, send some scholars or perhaps some works of art to have an exhibition in this country. And there will be an exchange on different levels. So undoubtedly, when Mahinda came, he came with uh, uh, um, all sorts of things. But his role in the, in the um, delegation was to introduce Buddhism. Um, exactly what language he spoke and that uh, th there's no record of that. It seems very unlikely that he knew Sinhalese. Um, so I would imagine that he, as, uh, the tradition says he stayed there for the rest of his life, which seems to be 
quite possible. So probably he spent some time there learning the language and then he uh, he uh, transmitted it to the people there and gradually taught uh, young men who uh, ordained. Uh, he taught them Pali and it has been preserved there pretty much accurately ever since. Something like that, I imagine. Anything else? No, none at the moment. Ah. Well, I'll try to think of something else to say. All right. Does anybody have any questions about anything else maybe related to what we have uh, spoken about? No. Oh, I'm very happy that I've explained everything so in such detail. Okay, here's one. Since you mentioned that the Sangha members chanted together to avoid mistakes written by... Since you mentioned that the Sangha members chanted together to avoid mistakes written by one monk, then what about the intonation? Can we see that different monks from different countries have chanted in different intonations? Absolutely, yes, certainly. So if you listen to Thai monks chanting Pali, sounds somewhat different from Singhalese chanting. And if you hear Burmese chanting, uh, you'll notice that it's somewhat different from the intonation is quite, somewhat different from the Thai. Okay. So um, what's the reason for this? Well, um, I, I, maybe I'm biased. No, I'm not biased here. I'm going to be um, straightforward. Sinhalese languages and Indo-European languages, as are most Indian languages. Okay. Sanskrit and Pali are both Indo-European languages. And so the intonation system, like the grammar and that, is fairly similar. Okay. Whereas Thai and um, uh, Burmese are quite different families of languages. So some of the intonation in Indo-European languages, they uh, have difficulty saying. So I'll give you an example. What, what's the most uh, famous, um, well-known uh, uh, hotel in Bangkok? It's the, uh, what's it called again? The Dusitani. The Dusitani Hotel. Okay. So why is it called Dusitani? Because that's the way the Thais say Tushita. So in Pali, as in Sanskrit, it's Tushita. But Thais have difficulty saying that, so they say Dusita. When you hear a Thai speak of Buddha, he usually he has problems saying um, Thai uh, intonation has difficulty saying B. So it usually comes out as P, Putta. Supadipanno. Bhagavato, Tawakatango. Yeah. But uh, so the intonation will certainly be different. Um, but um, uh, the important thing is that the, um, the meaning is understood. And of course, the meaning is understood in those languages, but the intonation is somewhat different from uh, according to what language your, your mother tongue is. Uh, but uh, my personal feeling is that uh, Singhalese translation is closer to the original, as close to the original as you could get. Okay. What do, you, do you have any idea on the origin of Pali language? The Buddha would use Pali. Um, you cut me off. You you have to go back a little bit. Uh, do you have any idea on the origin of Pali language? The Buddha would use Pali when he, when, please don't keep doing that, when he would be, be the reason to choose Pali to explain his teachings. Even there were a lot of languages used at the time. Mm. 
Um, I, I think that um, I, I explain the origin of Pali. Um, I'll just briefly do it again. Most scholars uh, believe that Pali is a literary language. Okay. So Buddhist monks would have been traveling around a lot, uh, encountering people who had slightly different languages, slightly different intonations, slightly different uh, vocabulary and what have you. So it was decided that, this is probably what happened, it was decided that we need to put it in a language that everybody could understand. And so an artificial language evolved, which we now call Pali. Now I'll give you an example of this um, until fairly recently in your part of the world, uh, Southern Philippines, um, Sarawak, Sabah, Malaysia, Indonesia, particularly in Sumatra, they spoke a language which is now called Malay. But in those different regions, their Malay was somewhat different. So in the Southern Philippines, it was somewhat different from it was in Sumatra. So merchants who were traveling around through all these areas, they basically uh, evolved. Nobody sat down and wrote it out, but in the process of communicating with people who spoke slightly different languages, a, a, a type of language evolved, which they usually call Bazaar Malay, which could be uh, understood by somebody who was traveling in that whole area. Uh, the same thing happened with Creole in, in the uh, West Indies and some other places and that. A language evolved which was understandable by people speaking slightly different languages. That's probably how Pali evolved and that's probably why it evolved so that it, the Buddhist teachings could be um, understood by people in a fairly large language area or language areas. Now, don't forget, we have very few uh, records of what was going on in the first three or four hundred years of Buddhism. So scholars have got to sort of try to work out or theorize what's happened. So we don't know for certain, but it was probably something like that. Venerable, could you please explain the difference between Sanskrit, Prakrit and Pali? I take it that the Buddha understood these. What languages would Prince Siddhartha use before he renounced and taught the Dhamma in Pali? Okay, so Sanskrit is a language, a very, very ancient language. Prakrit isn't a language. It is a name used for different types of languages. Okay, Pali is a Prakrit. Okay, the Jain scriptures are written in a Prakrit called Adri Magadhi. Okay, so you've got Sanskrit and Prakrit. So Sanskrit evolved in northern Pakistan, western, uh, sorry, eastern Afghanistan, about a thousand, three hundred, four hundred years before the Buddha. It is closely related to the uh, Iranian language. Okay, um, Prakrits, and as we uh, as we said, Sanskrit uh, eventually became. First of all, it became a liturgical language, a dead language. It was used only to chant the Vedic hymns, and then in the first, second, third century A.D., it started to become a classical language, mainly because of the grammar that had been written by Panini and it was used mainly by the upper crust of society, intellectuals and what have you. So it became a spoken language again, but only from a, a certain class of people. Okay, The ordinary people spoke Prakrits. So those Prakrits were just the ordinary spoken language. Once again, I would use the analogy of Latin in Europe. So if you were in Europe uh, 600 years ago, if you were a very learned person, you probably could speak the language of the town or the village or the district that you came from. Uh, but because that was the ordinary vulgar tongue. 
But when you were teaching in the university or when you were speaking to the king, you probably spoke Latin. So that it would have been exactly the same in India at the time of the Buddha and for many centuries afterwards. So Sanskrit, the word Sanskrit means polished. Prakrit means ordinary. Okay. So the Buddha probably spoke some Prakrit. Well, the Buddha spoke some Prakrit. And as I said before, probably a dialect of the region of Kosala rather than Magadhi. Okay. Did ancient Chinese monks translate Pali to Pitika? Okay, that's a good question. So, when did um, Buddhist monks start going to China? Probably in about the first century AD. Okay. So, uh, Indian monks went to China and then gradually Chinese uh, people, Chinese. Uh, converted to Buddhism. They became very interested in Buddhism. And so sometimes in later centuries, Chinese monks went to, to India. So there was a movement back and forwards. And eventually, um, the sutras were taken to China and translated into Chinese. But they probably were not translated from Pali. Because as we said before, by about the 1st or 2nd century AD, Sanskrit became the language of learning. So the Buddhist scriptures were translated into Sanskrit. Or they were rendered into Sanskrit. So it was Sanskrit uh, sutras, or it was the Buddha's words in Sanskrit that were taken to China and translated into Chinese. Okay. Dear Bhante, is it correct that the Tipitaka was written down in Sri Lanka, which was preserved in the Mahavihara, got changed or amended during Buddha Gosa's translation? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a lot of confusion here. So, is it correct that the Tipitaka was written down in, in um, Sri Lanka? Once again, I think, didn't I mention that? That the first record we have of the Tipitaka being written down was in Sri Lanka in about the first century BC. So, yes, that is correct. Okay. It was preserved at the Mahavihara. So, the Mahavihara was one of the big, important, the most important monastic community in Sri Lanka for a thousand years. Okay. And then, um, is it true that um, Buddha Gosa changed it? No, it is not, because he had nothing to do with the Tipitaka. He wrote commentaries on the Tipitaka. So the Tipitaka was preserved in Sri Lanka in Pali. The commentaries that the Sri Lankan monks over the centuries, the commentaries, the explanations that they wrote over the centuries were in Sinhalese. Okay. When Buddha Gosa came to Sri Lanka, he was asked to translate or to render the commentaries into Pali. So he took the commentaries, which were in archaic Singular and translated them into Pali. So he had nothing to do with changing or translating the, the Tipitaka. He worked on the commentaries to the Tipitaka. Is that clear? Right. We, the Theravadan Buddhists, are using Pali in the texts. Hmm. But what about the sutras from Mahayana? Uh, Buddhism, where they use Sanskrit, does the uh, does their do their sutras directly come from the old text? Well, that's a that, that's a very important question. Um, first of all, we have to make something clear. Theravada is one school or one sect of Buddhism. There is no one sect of Mahayana Buddhism. There are many Mahayanas. There's Zen Mahayana, and there's Pure Land Mahayana, and there's uh, numerous Mahayanas. Which one are you talking about? 
Okay. Zen is all in Japanese and it's very different from Pure Land Buddhism. Um, and so there are many, many different types of Mahayana. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is not all Mahayana sutras are in Sanskrit. What about the Tibetan ones? Most Tibetans don't know any Sanskrit. All their sutras are in Tibetan. Okay. And of course, I don't think there are too many Chinese Buddhists who know Pali or even Sanskrit. All their sutras are in Chinese because they were all translated into Chinese. Okay. So this is what happened. A movement, a general movement, which we can call mm -hmm. Mahayana, gradually evolved. Okay. And... Um, and it evolved from the original teachings of the Buddha. So when you look at some early Mahayana sutras, you find that there's really not very much difference between them, the Dhamma in them, and the, uh, the Dhamma in, in the Pali Tibetica. But gradually, uh, they evolved new ideas, new explanations, some of them very good, some of them very valid. They took some of the Buddha's ideas and, and explored them more deeply, and, and sometimes they drew deeper meaning out of them. Okay, So the early Mahayana Sutras don't seem to be that much different from the uh, Pali Tibetica. But as time went on and new ideas started to evolve, they certainly started to become quite different in some ways, although they still retain some of the earliest um, uh, teachings of the Buddha. So if you look at most Mahayana Sutras, early Mahayana Sutras or late Mahayana Sutras, you, f you find quite a lot of their, uh, what's in there will be familiar. You'll find dependent origination. You'll find the idea of sunyata. You'll find probably the Four Noble Truths and things like that. But you'll certainly find other things that are not uh, are later developments and many of them are quite legitimate developments but when you start to get into tantric buddhism then it certainly there's radical differences and my feeling is is that many of the tantric uh, texts owe more to hinduism than they do to to buddhism okay bante why some key sutras in Mahayana, such as the Heart Truth, are not seen in the Pali Tibetica? Well, I just answered that question because um, they date from the earliest um, Pragna Paramita Sutras, of which the Heart Sutra is one. That dates from about, about roughly about 500 years, 450, 500 years after the Buddha. Um, so there it's looking at things quite differently from how the Buddha did. But uh, it contains a great deal of wisdom. Don't forget, uh, just because something does not accord with what the Buddha said doesn't mean it is true. The Buddha didn't deal with everything. So it is only natural that people should seek deeper meaning or more meaning, try to draw meaning out of them. So simply because there are some things that were not taught by the Buddha doesn't necessarily mean it's not true or that it's not valid. I, I think that there's some parts of the Heart Sutra and the Diamond Sutra which are quite profound. Um, the sutras we are familiar with are in verse, are they? No, they're not. And that rhyme nicely. Did the Buddha really speak in verse? Were the suttas and the gathas reconstructed by later men? Is it later men? Well, no, the suttas are not in, in verse. Um, the majority of the suttas are in ordinary prose. Okay. But uh, it's not uncommon amongst the prose that you get some gathas, some verses. And uh, some books like the Jatikas have quite a lot of verses in them. And a book like the Sutta Nipata or the Udana have verses in them, but they also have prose. So the question is, did the Buddha speak in verse? And the answer is, he almost certainly did. Um... I can remember when I was in primary school, 
we were being taught how to tell the time. And then we had a lesson on the months of the year. And I can distinctly remember for the first time hearing September, January, March, September, November, which one is September? Oh, that's the one with the S, N is, no, yeah, okay. And then at the end of the lesson or towards the end of the lesson, the teacher chanted a verse. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except January alone, which has but 28 days clear and 29 in each leap year. I can still remember it more than 60 years later. Why? Because it's in verse. So she summed up what she'd been speaking for half an hour with a verse, and I still remember it. And I still use it to remember how many days there are in which month. 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except January, and so on, and so on, and so on. So did the Buddha speak th uh, like that? Yes, he most certainly did. It is very likely that at the end of, the, uh, of a talk that he gave, he would sum up the main points in a little rhyming verse, or sometimes two or three verses. And that's what the Dhammapada is, for example. It is a collection of verses spoken uh, or composed by the Buddha. Now, if you look at the, the Upanishads, which are a Bra Brahminical literature dating from roughly about the time of the Buddha, you get exactly the same thing. You get a teacher, uh, a Brahminical or a, a Sakrian teacher giving a talk, and at the end of it, he, he gives a little verse in which he sums up the main points of what he said in his sermon. So it seems that that was a style of teaching which was common at that time. And in a culture where everything was transmitted orally, probably any good teacher could do that. Okay. Um, here's another one. Dear Bhante, do you think that some words could be substituted from what the Buddha actually said to the different languages used? Uh, not sure what you mean. Um, do you think that some words, what Pali words or English words, could be substituted for what the Buddha actually said in the different? Sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can work it out. Do you mean that instead of using the word metta, we should use the word love? Or instead of using the word kilesa, we should use the word defilement or if you mean that, yes. In other words, uh, we should use the language that we're familiar with. So if you're familiar with English, uh, I see nothing wrong with using the word metta if you know what it means and the person you're speaking to knows what it means, why not use metta? But if you don't want to do that, why not use the word loving kindness or, com or, or love? What's wrong with that? So if that's not what you meant, I would ask you to uh, perhaps clarify uh, your question and then, then I'll, I'll try to answer it. Okay, how much, uh, we've certainly got more questions than I would have expected. Um, uh, how much time have we got left? Do we have any time for any more questions? We have time for 10 questions. However, there are no more questions coming in. Okay. Okay, so, okay. I, I'd, I'd like to finish by just mentioning one thing. Um, I spoke before that um, the, the um, sutras were eventually translated from Pali into Sanskrit and from Sanskrit they were taken to China and they were uh, translated into Chinese. And later on in the 9th, 10th century when Tibet started to embrace Buddhism, Tibetans went to India and they brought sutras back and they translated them into Tibetan. Um, and they did a very good job, as the Chinese did. Some of, their, some of their translations are very, very accurate. And you had masters like um, Kumarajiva, who was a master. He wasn't Chinese. Uh, 
he was a um, Sogdenian from Central Asia. And he not only did he learn Chinese, he mastered Chinese. And um, he, his translations are so in such fine Chinese that the Mandarin class, uh, who were originally very reluctant to embrace Buddhism, were so impressed by the beauty of his translations that it opened the way for uh, they had such appreciation for the beauty of the Kumara Jiva's um, translations that many of them uh, that he, his translations helped people to convert to uh, to, to embrace Buddhism. So, um, but this is what I wanted to mention. Uh, all of those, all of you who are Chinese will know about uh, Fa Hian and Chuan Sang and Yi Qing. So these were three uh, Buddhist, Chinese Buddhist monks who went to India specifically to get sutras so that they could bring them back and translate them. Uh, they were familiar with Chinese translations of sutras, but they wanted to know them in the original language. They wanted to be certain that these translations were accurate. And so what they did was extraordinarily audacious. Take uh, Fa Hian, who I think was one of the most interesting of these Chinese monks. He had no idea where India was. He walked all the way from China through Central Asia, across the Tian Mountains, then across the Hindu Kush Mountains, and then down through Afghanistan and Pakistan and into India. He had to swim across rivers, climb mountains, and he did all this with no money, no map, no traveler's checks. He didn't even have a credit card. And he did this because he had a deep desire to know the authentic teachings of the Buddha. And in the uh, years that he was in India, he collected a large number of sutras. Then he went to Sri Lanka, where he collected some more. And then he took a ship all the way from Sri Lanka past Malaysia, he went to Kedah, he stopped in Kedah, went past Singapore and he got up to Tuan Chau, Canton, what's it called now? And on the way, uh, the ship was nearly sunk by a storm. And the other passengers on the ship, they said, damn this monk and all his books, our ship's going to sink. To save the ship from sinking, we ought to throw him overboard and his damn books as well. <laughs> <laughs> and it was by a stroke of good luck that he wasn't thrown overboard. And this is the most remarkable thing about Fa Hian. He left China when he was 60 years old. He was an old man at that time. Such was his desire, his determination to, to, to get the Buddhist sutras in their original languages, so he thought. Um, so that he could make sure that they were accurate. Now, this is what I always used to say to my students. If people like Fa Hian, Chuan Sang, and many, many others, there were many others, if they would risk their life, if they would go off into the great unknown, risking all sorts of dangers and difficulties to get the sutras, shouldn't you read them? Shouldn't you make an effort just to pull a book out of the bookshelf or to buy a book and read them and study them? And I think the answer to that question is yes. We don't have to climb mountains or cross rivers to read the Buddha's words. They're all available now. So I say make an effort to learn the Buddha's teachings in your own language. And with that, um, we'll finish tonight. Uh, thank you for your questions. They were all really quite interesting questions. And um, I hope to be able to address you some other time. And I hope uh, that some of the things I said may have clarified things for you. Okay, good night.
Thank you, Bhante. Uh, would you like to answer the last question? Oh, yes, yes. I came in to clarify again. Okay, the mm. last question is Sadhu Sadhu. Uh, no, here we go. Dear yeah, Bhante, Bhante. Do, do you think some of the words that the Buddha uttered in the language he spoke could have been substituted with other words for the lack of those words when the teachings were translated into other language. But one day, I think I think the the questioner is asking about words lost in translation. Let's say due to the okay. limitations of the English language, okay. certain words cannot be used. Okay, right. Okay, well, I'll I'll give you an analogy. Let's say I give a talk, maybe a more structured and more formal talk than I have given tonight. Okay, and you go home, and your somebody at home asked you, "Oh, you attended a talk. What did he say?" Now, if you were paying attention. And I was clear enough and lucid enough in how I gave my talk, you could probably remember the main points that I made. You may even remember some of the very words that I used. I, I might have said something quite memorable, or I may have used a simile that stuck in your mind. Okay? So, if you had paid attention, chances are you would be able to explain to your friend a fairly good record of what I said. Not every word verbatim, but undoubtedly quite a lot of the things I said, and sometimes even sentences or a whole phrases that I said is possible. Um, so I think it was something like that with, with the Buddha. And one thing about the Buddha is that any teacher knows that you have a different audience all of the time. And so there is a tendency to say the same thing again and again. Not verbatim every time, but fairly similar. I'll give you an example. The well-known and very respected meditation teacher, S.N. Goenka. Now, I attended <laughs> a meditation course by him in 1970, uh, 1975, I think it was, a 10-day meditation course, and he gave a talk every evening, one-hour talk. Now, I attended another meditation course by him at least 15 years later, and he gave virtually exactly the same talk. <laughs> exactly the same. Now, that wasn't because he's lazy or anything like that. He had a standard talk. He had a completely different audience. Why not transmit the same thing? Now, I can't remember everything he said then, but altogether, I think I did five going to talks. So I heard every talk five, five times. And later on, because I was very interested in his approach to meditation, I got tape recordings of his talks. And I sometimes used to listen to them. Okay. So I really can't say that I remember any of them now, but I used to know them pretty well, because I'd heard them so often. And they were almost word for word. So I think it was probably something like that. Undoubtedly, there were audiences, uh, particularly monks who were close to the Buddha, who heard him say the same thing many, many times, particularly his similes. The Buddha's simile, you know, uh, uh, or his parables. So in the Bible, there are about 40, Jesus uses about 40 parables and similes. There are about 500 parables and similes in the Buddha's discourses, and all of them are very, very memorable. I have no doubt whatsoever that the Buddha used those parables. They're easy to remember because they're so striking, they're so clever, and sometimes they're rather funny. So, um, and once again, as I said, it is not to transmit the Dhamma, you don't need it absolutely verbatim what the Buddha said. 
I think there are many sentences, phrases, and perhaps whole passages in the Tripitaka that are, if not exactly the same as the Buddha, are very close to things that the Buddha said, and the rest are close to his meaning. And it's the meaning that's the important thing. And I'll finish by saying one last thing. Uh, when I lived in Sri Lanka, I was visiting once a very remote meditation center, very good meditation center. The monks there were very, very meditative. And because they lived very simple and austere lives, people had great respect for them. And so they had a waiting list, people wanting to give dana to these monks. So you had to go wait for sometimes two or three years for the opportunity to give a dana to these monks. And I stayed in this place for a few months. And before or after the dana had been given and the monks um, ate, before they ate, they would always give the people the five precepts and they would do a little bit of chanting, which is the normal way of doing things in Sri Lanka. And um, so the monks would say, Pana, Tipata, Veramani, and the people would repeat it. And then they would uh, hang around the meditation center for a few hours and that, and then they'd all get in their bus and they'd go home, and next week another bus or a truck full of devotees would come. And we monks, we used to, at four o'clock in the afternoon, we would come to the dana sala, the eating hall, to have a cup of tea. And when I first w was in this monastery, I came into the um, dana sala to have a cup of tea, and I heard, And there was nobody else there. And whoever it was had a very strange voice. And I was quite intrigued to know who or what was saying this. And I got up and had a look, and there were some minor birds. And what happens is that every day before the people deliver their dana to the, the monks, the minor birds and other birds come because they know that after the meal, when the plates are washed, uh, all the scrap rice will be around the washing place and they'll come and they'll eat it. So these minor birds sit on the edge of the roof waiting and they have heard the five precepts repeated so many times that they can say it. Do they understand it? Nope. Their pronunciation is very good. Do they understand it? They have no idea what it is. It's not how you pronounce it. It's not your intonation or whether you get the words in the right order. It's the meaning. Okay. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention and for your questions. <laughs> good night. Thank you very much, Bhante. I think the key takeaway for tonight is... Uh... Don't be a minor bird. I think the key takeaway for Ban from Bande tonight is it's important to read the suttas in whatever language that we understand, not necessarily in Pali. Okay. So, okay. Bande like to share merits to end the talk. Okay. Okay, so we have made much merit tonight by listening to the Dhamma. Um, and we should, um, it's a traditional thing to do to um, share the um, merit that we have made with all beings everywhere and hope that they can benefit from our positive thoughts and maybe also come into contact with the Dhamma. Okay. Ittavata charammi sangpadang punya sangpadang Sambhi devaranu modantu sambha sambhanti sindhya 
Right. Good night. Thank you, Bante. Good night, and uh, good night, everyone. And thank you for tuning in.